I'm going to, to start with a, a little bit of a preemptive uh, apology, perhaps, because this, as you can say, the, the title itself says it all, 200 years of Russian art. It's a little bit of a uh, mouthful. It's a big order. And I am afraid that I may have uh, sinned by excess of um, ambition. We'll, we'll try it the, the best we can. But for a disclaimer, what I, I'm teaching a class right now on the late USSR, we will end with this. But um, what struck me is that there is in the history of Russian art such a multitude of different, to say the least, um, discrepant and, and at times utterly contradictory facets of Russian art, which happen not successively, but sometimes at the same time. And so I, I decided to, to grapple with this uh, oddity, if you will, historically speaking, uh, and, and see whether there is any anything that comes out of it. And, and interestingly enough, I, what I believe uh, we can, well, I'm going to, to jump forward and, and see what uh, you know, what the audience will have to, to say and to ask at the end of the, the talk, but uh, I believe that what the, the kind of the, the golden thread that unifies these multitudes of different uh, chaotic, sometimes contradictory uh, forces at, at, at stake is the, is God, is the, and not only God, but the inescapability of God, that one, one tries to get rid of him, one tries to, to co convey his presence, but they, uh, basically God is always there. And say so that is this, uh, this very interesting, so when I re re refer to the sublime, I'm, I could have also used the word the divine, uh, and you will see it's, a, it's a complicated, at times uh, taxing, at times maybe even shocking um, aspect of the Russian history, but there was also some extraordinarily beautiful and very moving parts. Each one of uh, the audience will be able to decide by themselves. So let's begin with this. Um, I, I'm beginning at the turn of roughly after, after the, the death of Catherine the Great, the, 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 time, the, well, the end of the Napoleonic Wars and what... Um, is happening in Russia. It's not a new phenomenon anymore. One of the sources of it go back to Peter the Great, but basically Russia appears to be in search of its own identity and it is uh, being uh, torn apart uh, between different uh, directions. And what I, I took two totally different uh, quotations to begin this lecture. One is very recent and it's basically a cause the earlier one, which is about 200 years old, which is written by an author and romantic poet. So let's let's try by the second one, Kara, Karamzin, Nikolai Karamzin. We became citizens of the world, but ceased in certain respects to be citizens of Russia. The fault is Peter's. Peter's, in, he means, of course, Peter the Great, who was the one who began to develop a, a, a very rich uh, and complex uh, allegiance of Russia towards the West. 200 years old, I mean, a uh, little, um, uh, sorry, 19, well, yeah, almost 200 years, you know, 190 years later, we, we read this uh, contemporary um, critic, uh, search for mo a modern Russian identity, who basically says that Russian culture has uh, been, has uh, never been self-contained. It borrowed from everywhere, from the Chinese, from the French, from the Germans, from the Swedes, uh, et cetera, but it's never never been uh, its own uh, repository of a particular identity. Let me tell you outright that I actually disagree with both of these statements, and I actually believe that it's, the situation is far more complex, but that is the situation, and that is largely speaking, the, the perception that has been going on for something like two centuries about Russia and its relationship with the others, the others predominantly the West, the Western Europe in particular. So we start with this uh, in more ways than one, in more, uh, this iconic, um, uh, extraordinary piece by uh, Rublev of the Trinity, the Holy Trinity, um, of the Old Testament, which, sorry, used to be uh, uh, seen at the Tretarkov Gallery, but is no longer there. It's in, the, in 2022, so less than a year ago, by an order of the Kremlin, it was removed from the Tretarkov to go to the Sergius um, Sergei Lavra 
where it is now. But my point here is to show you already uh, back in the 17th century, 1671, at the hand of Simon Ushakov, the way the same theme uh, is possibly that Rubel of Trinity is one of the most important, the most famous uh, icon uh, in, in the Byzantine and Russian world. And uh, you can see that uh, in the 200 years later, 250 years later, Ushakov already began to uh, westernize, to use uh, certain tropes from the Italian Renaissance, from the Italian Baroque, to look at the, the degree of uh, uh, natural rendering of the facial features of the, the three angels, look at the, um, the, the very clearly uh, mastered uh, uh, technique of uh, the rendering of the perspective behind, the, look at even the table, the way that the seats are organized, everything is becoming three-dimensional, very real, look at also the, the calices, the table, the, everything is much more approachable from a realistic standpoint. So very clear distanciation from the earlier Byzantine tradition of Rublev himself. And architecturally, we see a very similar situation happening. Now we are in uh, the, the beginning, early uh, 19th century Russia, and look at this extraordinary uh, tour de force, architecturally speaking, by this Voronichin, Andrei Voronichin, who establishes the cathedral of uh, the Kazan Cathedral uh, in St. Petersburg, and who I think almost literally takes his model from none other than St. Peter's uh, Cathedral at, in the Vatican. The, the relationship is so obvious that it, uh, I mean, it has been mentioned many times, but it is very interesting how sudden, you know, over and over, Russia is going to look towards other sources, West, whether France, whether Br uh, Britain, Germany, or um, Italy in this particular case. Now, I want to show you this because that is quite, uh, quite extraordinary, that concept. This, the, the uh, so-called Assumption of the Virgin by Karl Briolov, 1836, was indeed in the Kazan Cathedral, which you see here. Uh, it was therefore des designed, uh, executed as an icon of what we know in the, the Orthodox tradition as the Dormition which you see to the right, and this is one of the uh, uh, early examples from the Kiev, um, the uh, Kievo Piechevsky um, uh, natural, natural um, so-called cultural reserve. Um, this is a very typical example to the right of what we understand as, as the Dormition, the repose of our uh, Holy Mother of God, who, uh, this is not going to be a, a, a lecture on theological terms, but it is here quite important to, to signify the difference between the Orthodox and the Catholic uh, conception of the passage of the uh, surgeon, surgeon of the Holy Mother of God on this earth to heaven. She goes in the Orthodox tradition, that's the term mission, from her being on this earth as the mother of God to return to her son, but also her creator. So you see the, the literally the juxtaposition from the mother of God to becoming the daughter of her creator. Now in the Catholic tradition, which the, the notion of the assumption, by the way, was a dogma that was instituted only in the 19th century. Um, so pretty much at the time when this particular picture to the left was created, there is no such thing as a dormition. The, the, the mother of God is taken, is elevated, assumption of the Virgin, and it's a, a theological move that mimics the move of a son uh, at the time of the ascension, the ascension of Jesus Christ. She is taken alive and elevated. So there's a completely different uh, approach to the same moment, but in theological terms, it could barely be further apart. Uh, when I, I, I want to, to give this quote by the Slavophile uh, critic Fyodor Chizov, who comment, com commented at the time on seeing Briulov's painting, the painting to your, la to your left, and he says, after seeing Briulov's painting, anyone can really mistake Briulov's picture uh, uh, for uh, an icon. In front of the icon, we pray 
to the holy face of the Virgin in front of Brielov's assumption, forgive me, says he, but you must agree that we only honestly think about a voluptuous, beautiful woman and that which ought to inspire prayer destroys holy prayer. So obviously, uh, uh, Chizov is, has very little sympathy, little empathy for this particular painting, but it has to be said that while we can revere those, those paintings in the Vatican or in any uh, Italian museum, it is very surprising, not to say even somewhat shocking, to follow uh, Chizov's uh, path to find a, such a representation of such a key moment in the, the, the history of the Holy Mother of God in an Orthodox church. So I'm just giving you all this to, to, to frame the complications, the complexities, and I even use the word contradictions late, uh, earlier on, that we're dealing with to, to begin with. At the same time, you see, you notice the existence of a, of a critic, a Slavophile critic, which is of himself, who tries to rectify this dimension. So another very important uh, critic, I'm just giving you the, lay, the, the laying the ground sort of theoretically, ideologically, so that you understand where we're starting with this, the, this moment where Russia is kind of being, like most countries in Europe, I should say, uh, like a sponge to the so-called romantic revolution. Uh, Chadayev's first philosophical, philosophical letter was extremely well known. Uh, and I, we, I quote, we are not part of any, great, any of the great families of the human race. We are neither of the West nor of the East, and we have not the traditions of either. We stand, as it were, outside of time. The universal education of mankind has not touched us. Um, and so here, Westerners like uh, Ch Chadayev, who very much was a, a, a champion of this, or another one was Herzen, um, saw orthodoxy and the presence of the, the, the assumption of God here to your, to the assumption, sorry, of the Virgin Mary to the left is very much part of, of this. They saw orthodoxy and the Byzantine or Byzantine heritage as the root cause of all evil in Russia. And they saw it as a backward past and the present had to run away from these uh, evil pernicious um, uh, roots. And the uh, essential, um, th th they were really trying to draw Russia towards what was much more to them uh, appealing, alluring the French, British, German examples of industrialization, further economic, political developments in their countries, being part of a European family and not of the barbaric East, that these were the key points of what Chadayev, Chadayev was uh, trying to articulate. He was far from being alone uh, in that particular letter. Um, and so among, so I mentioned the, the Romantic Revolution, um, Pushkin, whom we all know, uh, was very close to Chadayev and he very much espoused the, some of the ideals of this romanticization of a new Russia, Russia that would be uh, different, but in fact, that would not be that different since the, the, the ideal was to bring Russia in closer kinship with its neighbor, neighboring countries in Western Europe. Um, the uh, letter of freedom for, by, by, um, uh, uh, by Pushkin was a very important um, document, by the way, um, in, uh, in the overall romantic ideology. So I want to move on now into uh, what happens artistically, and this is going to be an interesting trope. Throughout the 19th century, when you think about uh, Russian art, you, you usually think about landscape art. Now, the, the presence of landscape painting in the larger history of art is by no means obvious at all. You could even say that with a few uh, extremely rare exceptions, there is almost no such thing as landscape painting until the, that particular moment that we are talking about, the, the, the romantic moment. And in fact, there's a particular date, 1817, when in the French Academy, uh, suddenly there is a reformation that enables, that allows legitimately artists of a low grade, it should be said, it's, a, it's considered a minor, minor genre, but artists who basically cannot do anything, could not 
do religious painting, could not do historical painting, mythological painting, the grand and noble genres of the academy, they were accepted as kind of a fifth wheel of the, of the carriage, if you will, as a sort of a, those who couldn't do any better, and they could do landscape painting. The first member of that uh, academy who received that uh, sort of uh, humbling uh, designation was somebody called Michalon, who is a, a professor of Coro. But what I want you to see is the quasi-immediate repercussion, in fact, immediate, this is actually, this predates by one year, the creation of uh, landscape painting as a genre in the French Academy. And this is by Cherin, a view uh, from the Petrovsky Island uh, in St. Petersburg. Look at the detail of everything. You, you recognize the, the tower bell in the background, um, uh, as the, 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 the tower bell of, uh, the Zdavno, I'm sorry, I need my notes, Zdanovka River, um, the port of the main building of the second cadet corps, for those of you who are interested, and in the central uh, central part in the background, this is the bell tower of the Vladimir Cathedral. So extraordinary changes in the history of um, Russian art at the, same, at the same time as this happens to uh, coincide with what is going, going on in Western Europe. Throughout, so we're going from 1816 here to 1889. Throughout the 19th century, basically, you can you could organize a, a fascinating exhibition. Um, maybe that will happen at the Russian History Museum. Who knows? Uh, but that would cover uh, decades of Russian painting, declensing the history of nature, the history of, of landscape. Of course, of all in the the difference, the many differences, but one of the perhaps topmost, what one could call it, the synecdoche of landscape painting in Russia is the birch tree. The birch tree is the quintessential element that uh, symbolizes, that expresses the very identity of Russia. And I expressed from the very beginning how Russia is looking for new identities. So you would never see uh, such a thing as a birch grove in the paintings by Monet, uh, Pissarro, Sisley, any of the Impressionists or, or any of the British or German, German artists. You do see it here with Levitan. What I also find interesting here is the actual way this uh, landscape is composed. It's on the one hand very luxurious, very uh, ebullient, you know, joyful. Look at also the, the, the sparkling details, those, the, those uh, to the tips of the, those flowers, those purple tips, and, and the, the, the patches of uh, light that are streaming through the, the, the foliages of the tree. There's something very alluring, very exciting about this. At the same time, you notice that there's no skyline. Don't see, don't see the sky at all. You guess the presence of the light through the filtering of the sunlight through the, the foliages, but there's no horizon. And there is this kind of, I, I find it very interesting, this double edge by which you you are brought into this um, beautiful incandescent uh, landscape lit up by the sun. And at the same time, you are in a kind of quasi claustrophobic space since there's no exit. You don't know where, there's no, no path either. You don't exactly know where you came from, where you're going to go. There's no room up above beyond the trees. You're sort of uh, trapped in a way within this gorgeous um, uh, natural uh, slice. You should know that, uh, of course, this was done by Levitan, who was a, a Jewish artist at the time when the pogroms were going on. Uh, Levitan, in, I'm not going to give you a whole biography here, he's a very, maybe the most important landscape artist of the 19th century in Russia, that was going through uh, spans, uh, pangs of depression, uh, in fact, even tried to commit suicide. And so this, this, this notion, the, the feeling of anxiety that is perhaps contained here, even though part of most of the, 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 the landscape itself is very alluring, is perhaps re a reflection of the complications that this artist was going through himself. So I want to now look back at some other aspects of uh, nature, which also reflects um, what is going on in 
uh, Germany no, no, namely, but, but other countries as well, but with a romantic revolution, and I'm, I'm quoting Novalis, nature is God, uh, one sees this association between this kind of prolongation between nature and the divine. The nature is a reflection of the divine, the divine is, is seen as embedded in nature, and there's a sort of uh, almost seamless prolongation from one to, to the other. Uh, now this is, this particular uh, painting is done at the same time, uh, sorry, excuse me, not at the same time, but, sorry, but um, about a few years later, five years later than the previous one, by the same artist, Isaac, Isaac Levitan. Levitan was a very close friend, very close friend of Chekhov. And this particular painting is actually uh, executed uh, not very far from uh, Chekhov's home in uh, Krem, in Crimea. And uh, the, the two were always um, exchanging um, ideas and, um, and the correspondence is absolutely fascinating. At this particular point, uh, Levitan knows that he is terminally ill and was going to die a few years later at the age of very uh, early age of 39 years old. So the feelings that I began to, to see um, five years before in this particular painting, you see them kind of exacerbated in this extremely beautiful and sublime looking painting, but one that is at, at the same time very much um, sort of riveted to the notion of the end, the end of one's self on, on this earth and the questions of course of what next? I want to show you uh, here an obvious source, as far as I'm concerned, by the chief uh, member of the German Romantic uh, group, Caspar David Friedrich, with this particular painting in, in Germany. But I want to continue on this stroke. We're back to, to Russia. And so the uh, when I mentioned the, the, the link between nature and the divine, it becomes considerably exacerbated by this absolutely huge painting. Those of you who are familiar with the Tretyakovskaya Galeria in Moscow uh, know uh, this painting. It's one of the most uh, visible, one of the most um, visited and popular painting. Uh, it was not always the case for sure, because when this vision of uh, Christ in the landscape uh, pointed at by um, St. John, uh, the predecessor, who's, uh, uh, who was being celebrated yesterday for the, 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 the uh, two uh, appearances of his uh, skull. Uh, so this particular scene was by no means welcome uh, by the uh, authorities of the uh, Orthodox Church when, when it appeared. I think one, I mean, I, I don't believe, I'm very happy to be, to stand corrected if that's the case, that there is any particular theological anomaly in, in this, but it is the, the, just the overall depiction of this particular painting. First of all, Christ is seen very far at a distance. He is uh, almost unnoticed, unnoticed, unnoticeable. And maybe that is in fact Ivanov's own intention. Uh, and and the, the chaos of the ambient people who are running around some naked. So what, what, what are they doing exactly? They don't know where they're looking. They're, they're looking at St. John the Baptist, but they're not, with one or two exceptions, they're not looking towards, towards Christ, Christ. This created quite a uh, um, quite an outcry and um, was seen as a deeply problematic rendering of a very important um, uh, evangelical scene and was even seen sometimes at, as outly, outrightly blasphemous. Uh, by the uh, Ivan Kramskoy, uh, a scene that was also very much critiqued probably for the same kind of reasons, which is that if you take, if you sort of uh, omit the fact that St. John the predecessor uh, wears one attribute and, and holds the cross, there's almost no religious attributes whatsoever. And in this particular painting, there's not what whatsoever. So of course, one does recognize Christ, and it's ma mainly uh, so through the, the, the title, but otherwise he is stripped of any traditional um, attributes that the Byzantine tradition would have would have wanted uh, him him to to, to put on the uh, the Lord. 
he is seen as one of us. He is seen as a human being uh, torn with, uh, obviously, uh, emotions and uh, and rendered as a human being in his own suffering during the, the uh, his um, uh, the, during the uh, Lent the, of the of the forty days in the wilderness. Uh, this particular painting was, uh, in a way, as, as the previous one that happened before then, but th there was a very important moment in 1863, which happens to coincide literally with an extremely important moment in the West with a Salon des Refusés in Paris. Well, in Russia, uh, about a, a small group of uh, 14 students whom you see photographed next uh, to this, including Kramskoy, uh, walked out of the Imperial Academy of Arts in refusal to enter into the competition. So this was the first sort of act of bravura by a group of artists who uh, simply refused to go by the tradition, long held a secular tradition of uh, Byzantine painting in, in Russia. And this was the, the beginning of a revolution that would carry on very far. Uh, we have here the same artist, but what I want to show here, and this is what I find interesting when I mention these contradictions, you see here uh, on, the, on the face of it, this painting is simply a beekeeper who is um, about to cut his, the, the, the grass over, over growing and, and keeping these beehives seen in the background, period. There's nothing more to it. But we know there is more to it. And we know that this particular person, the way he's seen, he's carrying a cross, is obviously an, a reference, it, if not an emblem or a metaphor for the, for the hermit. And, and who knows, even perhaps for, for Christ himself, there's not, not, there's not enough in the, in the picture itself to tell us exactly what the whole message of the painting is about. But it is open to any kind of religious interpretations and it was definitely read in this particular way. There's no question here that the, the deep love of landscape that uh, inflects Kramskoy's own creation is uh, con to totally cons cons consonant and parallel to his own deep Christian spirituality. We're going to see that that was not always the case, but with Kramskoy, absolutely no question. Now, nature can also be a vessel for mythology. I'm going to give you a couple of uh, examples to very, very well-known fables, even Ivan Saryevich uh, befriending the, 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 the awe-inspiring, frightening gray wolf, and then the gray wolf helping him eventually to, to uh, meander through the, the, the frightening, threatening dangers of the, the deep forest and eventually uh, releasing liberating his uh, princess, as you see on this particular scene. And then to your right, Billy Bean, the illustrating a very famous uh, fable of Baba Yaga uh, and the, the beautiful little Basilia ex, uh, escaping from uh, the, the grip of this, um, this witch, essentially. Um, so these fables are very much part of the tradition that we are talking about. Nature is always the sort of vessel that carries through these different um, myths or, or stories. Now we're back not to mythology, but to religion. Nyestyarov, very much part of a, a group of artists who, uh, uh, further than, much further than Levitan, in fact, not, not to les sees, uh, conduit in a romantic way between nature and the divine, but actually sees a, a complete communion between nature and the divine. Nestyarov uh, was trained, you maybe see this in these particular paintings, maybe the, in particular the one to the left, uh, which represents the, the, the great Saint uh, Sergei uh, Nazdarov, uh, Saint Sergius. He was trained as an icon painter in his youth and, uh, and then went on from becoming an icon writer, an iconographer, to become an historical painter. And there's a sort of natural conduit, one might say. Uh, and the influence of both of these uh, genres are very evident in this, in this work. Um, so uh, you could say that, in fact, Nesterov here marries, con conjugates icon painting with enormous storybook-like 
like the, the type of works you, you see before, uh, a, a type of Russian style a mythological uh, illustration, then and creates this, this, this kind of paintings, which really becomes absolutely unique to himself. You notice, by the way, to the left, the far left of the painting, to the right side of Saint Sergei, the, the inevitable birch tree that is the, and you see the same thing again to the left of the other painting to your right, the taking of a veil, which represents a, a group of nuns and novices who are about to marry the church and uh, and adopt uh, uh, their convent. Um, so uh, I try to tell you before, we're going to see many different facets many, and opposed, sometimes almost violently opposed facets of the same situation happening. So at the same time as this tradition of looking at, at nature as either a romantic trope announcing the divine or in relation with the divine in some sort of uh, um, amorphous or difficult to describe kind of way, I'm talking about Levitan, or in the kind of, in the, in the way Niestov does it in a much more uh, direct, clear, factual way, nature is the vessel of the divine. At the same time as those things happen in the 19th century, you have the absolute opposite where uh, there's a tradition that is uh, also stemming, that is what is interesting, from the, the kernel, kernel of romanticism or romantic ideology that penetrates through the Russian cultural fabric of the 19th century and turns radically against the church, radically against the divine, uh, pronounces, I mean, sort of illustrates the abuses, those so-called cases of corruption, of, of um, you know, drunken uh, uh, priests who do not uh, uh, stay up, to, do, do not uh, uh, serve the, their religion. And so one of the big uh, re representatives of this is Perov, Perov with the Easter procession in a village with his two clerics who are uh, overly drunk and these uh, the, the procession themselves what is interesting if you look at the details the one to the left is actually holding an icon the uh, upside down the middle um, detail shows you that the bagarre is but without her eyes so therefore this is not an icon and uh, you see to the to the right the priest having broken an egg a symbol of um, pasra another uh, absolutely characteristic rendition of the same genre is this opposition between um, this uh, so social uh, satire of a priest who is uh, abundantly um, um, eating his um, meal and uh, the servant pushing uh, away some of um, you know uh, poor indigent uh, father and son who are begging for attention uh, repin one of the most important um, artist of the late 19th century, he will he will survive the the uh, Bolshevik Revolution. Uh, this is uh, what I find interesting in this particular painting, which is very famous at the Tretiakov and other Easter procession. Far less on the face of it, uh, critical or acerbic towards the clergy, although it's definitely not a uh, uh, eulogic uh, piece. But it's uh, difficult to pinpoint exactly what is wrong there's a ton of stuff going on i mean including the the lady who were dressed in the center in the western clothes and holding the icon and you know, the critique the critics of the time were saying well she's obviously someone who has bought her right to to carry the icon the crippled boy to the left was pushed back violently by somebody to to join back the crowd there's some disturbing details in that crowd but overall it's difficult to say exactly what is um, uh, perturbing and at the same time that's what i i want to put to you for uh, consideration is that you could almost read this as equally critical as it is in fact maybe an homage to these uh, russian orthodox crowds in the 19th century scorched under the sun uh, with you know obviously very little means to, to, to live adequately and who are yet walking through uh, miles and miles through these, these processions. There is something very impressive in that very scene itself. So one has this 
as I began to tell you before, is kind of we are torn apart in a way when you look at a painting like this and thinking, what, what am I thinking? What am I doing? What is the artist trying to tell us here? And it seems that this contradiction is locked at the center of um, many of those uh, scenes. Um, similarly, I mean, this, this painting uh, was uh, Ilian, Ilian by Repin, the depiction of Ivan the Terrible um, having killed his son, a theme that is resonating uh, throughout the, the history of Russia in, at large, a uh, painting that was a considerable uh, subject of scandal, was reprehended, was uh, forcibly removed uh, at some point, and um, which was eventually bought by Tretakov, and, and you can see it uh, today in Tretakov. You know? So this, again, utter contradiction of human feelings between a father who murders his son and at the same time embraces him passionately. And look at the, the eyes of, um, of this particular piece. I, I should say that uh, this particular painting you can imagine what it was like uh, in, in 1885. In 1913, um, it, was, um, uh, it was attacked by a descendant of an old believers family, Abram Balashov. That was in 1913, but in 2018, so that is five years ago, a drunken museum visitor walked in the Tretarkov gallery and attacked this particular painting. Uh, so each time this painting has had to be restored. What is absolutely fascinating is that uh, despite those two attacks a century apart, the uh, dazzling and, and, and uh, uh, awe-inspiring eyes of uh, Ivan the Terrible were never touched. And so there was this uh, uh, strange move, you know, uh, sort of moment of release, uh, really a relief, sorry, by, by the fact that uh, this painting was damaged, but the, the central part was not uh, was not removed. What is interesting is that um, so this this painting was done only at a very sensitive time as well, only a few years, four years exactly after uh, the Tsar Alexander II was killed by a bomb thrower, uh, Irnievsky. Uh, so the, the painting uh, was his son uh, Alexander III simply banned it from public viewing in 1885. Yet the ban, for some extraordinary reason, didn't last very long at all. And three months later, the ban was, was lifted uh, and Tretakov bought it immediately. So a very loaded painting, to say the least, very much part of the tradition we are talking about. So I'm, I'm stopping here. The, um, the cleansing, I'm, I've only scratched the surface. Let, let me uh, tell you, and there's so much more that could be said about um, nature in the history of Russian painting in the 19th century. I want to point out something that is not so well known and which happens at the same time as what we're talking about. So, and this is kind of the other side of the same coin. So while roughly speaking, throughout both aspects, contradictory aspects of what you've seen so far is going on, the presence of the West is absolutely inevitable, inevitable. You're looking at uh, the history of, of, of Russian painting, the birth of landscape painting, I've, I've seen it, comes from the French Academy, and basically Russia is trying to negotiate, Russian artists are negotiating their positions in relationship to that very dominant trope in Western Europe, in France mainly. Now, when talking to about, about something that cannot, does not, could not happen in France or anywhere in Western Europe. And that is that at the same time as all this was going on, a considerable, I mean, astronomic uh, uh, effort is going on at all, uh, throughout the, 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 the country, throughout the different regions, throughout the different uh, professions, curators, museum directors, collectors, tsars, um, etc., are on going on trying to recreate, to amass, assemble the lost treasures of the long secular Byzantine history that goes back to the 10th, 12th century, or and sometimes even before, going back to even early Byzantine Greek um, iconology, iconography. And how is this done? Well, it's very simple. Uh, 
it's, it's done by massive acquisitions, the way Russian sovereigns were used to doing it. As you may know, it, Catherine the Great, when she uh, decided that she liked a particular uh, item or items, would just send one of her emissaries in an auction house in Paris, London, or wherever, and says, buy the lot. And so the emissary would buy the entire auction, if you can imagine that, the whole catalog, just just full on. And that's pretty much what her uh, descendant, Alex uh, Alexander III, yes, um, was doing by uh, buying up entire uh, collections. You have here one from a, a very famous um, collector, Vasilievsky, Alexander Vasilievsky, who resided in Paris, but had amassed an absolutely colossal collection of uh, every kind of aspects of the Byzantine uh, history, um, but, but tons of icons. And this was bought as a lot and is now the State Hermitage Museum. And that led to uh, various uh, exhibitions, various uh, reconsiderations. There were a number, and suddenly you had scholars who started to, to delve into the history of Byzantine art. And to this day, those scholars are notorious as having created, recreated in a way, a science that didn't exist until, until then. Uh, here is a, 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 an image of the type of Look at the style of showing, the style of curatorial style of what happened in the museum created by, his, by Alexander III himself, the, the Russian Museum. This is, another, this is not the State Hermitage, this is another example. And so what you had this colossal uh, effort that itself uh, created an amazing impact. We don't often hear about it because what we see is the type of, of, of slides I've showed you of the, the Russian tradition of landscape painting. And what we know uh, about Russian art is what we're going to see now. That, of course, we know. But what we see is the, the artists who lead to the most revered, the most uh, uh, known um, aspect of Russian tradition in 200 years, which is what we know as the Russian avant-garde, the group of artists we're going to talk about now, who practice art, create are the authors of abstraction, essentially, Malievich, chief of them, uh, in during the Russian Revolution. So leading to this, uh, Vrubel is an, is an artist who himself was very, very uh, immersed in iconography uh, himself. Uh, and this is a one very famous painting, The Demon Seated, um, 1890. So that is exactly uh, constant, this contemporaneous with the efforts led by Alexander III, but also all the scholars, curators, directors, museum collectors who uh, develop a new taste and a new knowledge for Byzantine iconography. And Vrubel himself, I would like you to look at the, the, the right-hand part of this composition, not so much the central part, the demon himself, but look at this kind of abstract model here. And that, that painting itself was often discussed in the West as a kind of response to or a dialogue with what goes on with the early modernist uh, masters, Cezanne chief of all. And you would see this kind of details put together. And that seems convincing enough, except that this is only half or maybe not even half of the story. The truth is that Vrubel, I mean, this doesn't mean that, of course, Vrubel would have known Cezanne, no question about that, who did not know Cezanne, but he knew other things than Cezanne, namely St. Sophia Cathedral, where he had been uh, in Kiev many, many times, and he not only had been uh, 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 immersed in the, the mosaics of uh, this 11th century cathedral, and absolutely extraordinary, um, my wife being uh, from Kiev, I had the pleasure of um, seeing this uh, absolutely unbelievable treasury of uh, mosaics and of uh, icons. It's um, some, some of the most moving aesthetic uh, experiences I can recall. Well, Rubel was deeply, deeply familiar with that. Not only was he familiar with that, but he was actually not so much, he was not an icon painter like Nestor, but he was actually an icon restorer. And he spent a lot of time 
uh, spending time cleaning, restoring some of these frescoes. And in some case, actually creating, just creating, I should say, duplicating, copying um, one of those. You see one, an example here, the angel's lamentation in the, another church, the St. Kirill church in Kiev, 1884. So here are some of the, you could say, champions of the phenomenon I'm uh, discussing. Um, and I'm go just going to read you a few things here. So you have one who is a father himself, Father F F Paviel from Florensky, very important um, person who, um, I cannot, uh, Kunin is also very important. You should really simply Google each one and every one of these individuals. They really can be credited each and, and now each one of them have, has a whole school and whole group. So it really went very, very far deep in Russia at uh, every level of society. And so I'm just going to call Father Paviel here, uh, who, uh, and that's the point I'm going to try to make as we move in now to towards the uh, revolutionary art of the, the so-called avant-garde. Here's how he describes uh, the language of iconography of Byzantine. Term. He says that the, that the iconographers of the early Byzantine tradition used the language of rejection, revolution, rule breaking. These are, these are his words, which are absolutely typical of what the avant-garde polemics that are only a few, not even two decades away from the, the, the point we're talking about right now. Uh, the Russo-Byzantine art, uh, said Paviel Florensky, Father Paviel Florensky, was conscious, consciously discarded linear perspective. So the relationship that you see between Vrubel and Cezanne in terms of getting rid of perspective, that's true. But according to Florensky, Kunin, and Tara Bukin, they did, Vrubel and Malevich later, did not need Cezanne in order to reach that point. They only needed to look at Byzantine tradition. And we know for fact that they certainly looked at it, really lived with it in almost inside, you know, spent their time going to church to work on, on icons, you know. Uh, so this, this uh, religious art, the kind, and that's the other side is that the, the, the kind of art produced during the Renaissance in the West was fundamentally different from sacred art. We, we find an argument we heard about earlier on when we looked at this so-called assumption of the Holy Mother of God, you remember? And so that why, how is uh, religious Italian art different from sacred art? It's an interesting distinction here. Well, because Sacred art is embodied, say, says uh, Pavel Florensky, in iconic, iconic re representation, and the latter, the icon, ought to be thought of as visualized theology, or uh, another term, God's words materialized as images, which is a, a very it's a fantastic, very packed definition of what an icon is, in my opinion, whose true function, the function of the icon, hinged on the articulation of what Florensky calls a divine reality. Okay, so we could go on and on with this. I mean, the, the Florensky also, and both uh, Poulin and Tarabukin uh, echo this, uh, eulogized the contemplative and creative era uh, that uh, blossomed with Byzantine uh, iconography. And now, how is this relevant to what we're going to see now. So here are some of these uh, icons that those. Uh, so I actually want to, yes, to make an interesting kind of little about it. We don't have much time because I see the clock uh, clicking, but um, ticking, but uh, an interesting visitor in Moscow in 1911, when, when all this is just like absolutely coming to the fore is Matisse. And Matisse comes back with notes and notes about how important icon, icons were and the flattening of the perspective that, that um, um, Father Paviel was uh, eulogizing. Uh, this is 1911, uh, Matisse takes that home and once, one has never seen a word about the influence of uh, Moscow, of what Matisse saw in Russia. One always talks about the influence of Matisse in, in Russia, but not the influence of, of Russia on Matisse. So I think that this is a small kind of interesting note. 
Uh, I'm going to try to speed up the rhythm a little bit because we still have uh, quite a bit to cover. I'm just showing you here the obvious immediate, and so this is kind of intermediary uh, slide, the impact of um, this immersion in the Byzantine world and the way it's treated here in a completely symbolic, nothing to do here with the actual technique of iconography, but there's uh, clearly uh, a lot to do. Another source is what, and I'm not, I don't have time to uh, spend enough um, attention to this, but it's the, the, the vast industry of popular imagery that were floating throughout the uh, empire of Russia from uh, east to west, and which were often utilizing or using uh, iconographical uh, imagery as a source. Uh, Tatlina, I know the picture to the right is not very good, but I'm just looking here at the simple schematization, triangulation, uh, the, the way uh, the treatment of the face of this sailor uh, obviously owes a lot to early uh, icons. Uh, Goncharova, Natalia Goncharova, very well-known artist, but very few, one never or very seldom sees uh, the fact that she too looked at um, early iconography. Uh, in this particular case, what is interesting in the way the savior, the Pantocrator is, is seen, is with the, the two fingers, which, as you know, is a reference to the old believers. And so she was interested in the old believers. We really don't have time to talk about the old believers, but I'm, I'm urging those of you who have not heard about this fascinating concept going back to the 17th century to, to look it up. What's interesting is that the old believers who were kind of uh, the, the saw themselves as the repositories of the older tradition of Byzantine uh, to, uh, culture and faith uh, were pretty much banned in Russia after Peter the Great and were tolerated for the first time by, by Nikolai II in 1905 by a special um, law. So you saw them come back to the fore in uh, 1905. And I think that's uh, what you see with this work by Gontrarova. So Vasily Kandinsky, Vasily Kandinsky, the father of abstraction uh, and a fascinating artist himself, um, is often, um, you know, champion, well, is systematically championed as the creator of a completely new language that has going, that will have an immense ramifications throughout the 20th century uh, in Russia and above and in, in Europe and in America eventually. What we have not seen much is the fact that he too was absolutely fascinated by um, Byzantine tradition, collected uh, icons, collected uh, cru uh, cru crosses, and, and a lot of those uh, popular images that I showed you. I was recently in Munich in the Landbach House, which is the largest co collection of Vasily Kandinsky's works, and the, the curators for the first time unlocked the possession that he and his wife had, and it was absolutely fascinating to see the the number of uh, icons of St. George, for instance, absolutely incredible. Well, here in this painting, which is called All Saints, after all, which is also from the Lenbach House, uh, you see, in fact, in a mirror kind of effect, uh, the, the source of this is the ascension of the prophet Elijah. You have to um, see that the horse in the icon, to the 15th century icon, is going this way. And in the Kandinsky, it's a mirror effect. It's going the opposite way. But the whole composition reflects the uh, Novgorod icon. I mentioned Malievich before. The black square, of course, doesn't seem to carry at first, even though it's in the Tretiakov gallery next to a, an extraordinary collection of icons, um, doesn't seem to uh, carry uh, uh, much iconography itself, except that uh, Malievich himself was absolutely constantly referring to religion in different ways. And look at the way he was positioning the uh, black square, almost like an icon in a, in a corner um, in, in himself. Tatlin, uh, likewise, um, fascinated by icons. Um, now we are go entering into what happens during that short period of 1918 to the, say, to the time when Lenin dies in 1924, during which an extraordinary group of artists 
are going to revolutionize in more ways than one the practice of, of art. And that is going to have an astounding impact on, on, the, on the West, namely America, ironically. But, um, so what happens to the artists who began to work you know, doing what they were doing before. Well, some of them adjusted to the, uh, the precepts or the demands of the new, um, the new world, the new era, the revolutionary era. Uh, uh, Malievich, what I find interesting, and this has been discussed um, before, uh, is sort of establishes a new cult of the Black Square. And I, you see, see in this picture of a group of there of these uh, uh, artists. Uh, close to him and you see on top this kind of dark figure on top left first of all there's a, the the black square floating everywhere Malievich is the guy with a cap and a, and, a, and a round picture in the center just above him two three heads before you see a guy who has a like a little icon uh, on his label on his jacket and that's a, a small a miniature of the black square the black square is carried around as a as a mini icon itself so um, I just want to qu quickly qu quote this uh, this uh, sentence, I mean, the culture of creating gods passed unnoticed in our time when we started to exist. Try as we might to overthrow the idols on the square. Um, uh, try as we might to overthrow the idols on the square, to throw them, them down from the altars. All of a sudden you look and see that one of our comrades has inconspicuously become a god. Art will make him an icon, distrib distribute it among us so that everyone may know and see the new God. So this is very, I think, symptomatic of the kind of relationship between uh, humankind and God uh, during that uh, extraordinary uh, complex moment of the, the, the Russian Revolution, filled with promises during the early years of the, the the revolution and that itself is going to uh, quickly turn around and lead to a totally other aspect of this talking about contradiction here this is a violent uh, murderous um, uh, aspect of the russian revolution that turns into one of the greatest iconoclastic and um, and, and and murderous literally situation um, does it stop the proliferation of icons? Does it stop the uh, fascination of um, religion among many, many of these artists? Absolutely not. And look at this relation. And in fact, one of the, the I'm going to, to say uh, something about Misha and the, 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 the museum, which uh, Misha will tell me when, when that exhibition took place, you, you brought at some point some elements brought in from Soviet Russia that were literally mimicking some of the uh, iconography that we are talking about. And that itself opened my eyes and I decided to keep looking further into this. So in many ways, I, I have to thank you for um, instilling this interest um, in me. The, I said before, the early years of the Russian Revolution, the early years of suprematism of Malievich uh, and the new abstraction are very quickly dismissed after Lenin himself was not a great aficionado anyway of uh, abstraction, but Stalin even, even less so. And this uh, exhibition, 1933, so that's exactly 20 years after this 1913 exhibition where you see so many icons, hundreds and hundreds of, of icons brought up to the public. Here you say goodbye to abstraction. This is the last time that, in a way, um, you see Malievich pushed aside in a small room uh, in this huge exhibition in Leningrad. And after that, basically, abstraction is banned. Uh, nonetheless, when he dies in two years, two years later, look at the way this, this uh, he created the, the, the very ritual for his own uh, burial. And you see him here. Uh, um, on his uh, on his deathbed with his grave, which he designed himself, fascinating. So um, we're going. I, I know time is passing, so I'm just you. Non, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this material. In a sense, yes, atheism becomes the religion, the state religion, for several decades. Um, this is, I'm not going to comment much on this. Uh, in this particular part of this presentation religion seems to vanish almost, except perhaps you might say 
through the kind of deification or sanctification of some of those figures. And this is a very famous icon here by this Vera Mujina. Here she is to the right. And here's a portrait of her by Nesterov. And uh, at the same time, the, the kind of eulogization of a new, new Moscow society. We see a young woman, uh, independent in 1937, driving her own car in the middle of Moscow street. How likely was this? But, you know, nonetheless, um, this is uh, what we saw during the socialist realist propaganda moment. And what is uh, fascinating is this moment where after, and I, I just want to say in 1937, these are the statistics, 87,000 priests, Orthodox priests, were murdered by Stalin and his regime. This is one year. A few years later, during World War II, suddenly uh, Stalin turns his back and authorizes, sort of gives some form of semi-legitimacy to, to the church, as it seems to be well needed in the midst of the tragedy um, undergone by the entire Russian population, including, of course, and first, first and foremost, the army itself. Um, but I think this should not hide from us and just giving this, this um, great icon of the new martyrs and confessors who are celebrated during that particular day and should be celebrated every day of the year. Um, so they, he's talking about contradiction here. There's perhaps no more um, fierce moment than this, this 20 or 30 years, or maybe even, be even bigger, longer, but after Stalin sort of dies down a little bit, we're going to see how that happens. But this moment where basically religion is thrown out of the door and brought back in and, and, and yet, yet never, never completely goes away. So we're going to say goodbye to Stalin now uh, and look at what happens afterwards. It's a relatively, the Thor, the famous Thor, means that Khrushchev and his successors sort of close an eye or are sort of benevolently, more or less benevolently look at the, the religion in, in art. Um, doesn't mean that atheism does not continue to be, the, of course, the dominant uh, ideology for sure. But I, I love the fact that this, this uh, poster, of, uh, this caricature of Gagarin looking for God and not finding him, Bogan yet, uh, is an exact echo of John 119, no man hath seen God at any time. Uh, the only begotten son, which is the, the of the father, he has declared him. Uh, yet again, again, another sort of side to these ongoing and, and slightly weird, uh, if you think about it, uh, contradictions so in the midst of this atheistic society, suddenly in 1961, a stamp, a new stamp of the Soviet Union commemorates uh, the birth of Andrei Rublev. After and, and we, we might wonder, well, what was this for? You know, so the, most of the uh, fifth, uh, the church, uh, the number of churches had gone from five to one. Uh, from every five church, four were either closed or most like most likely destroyed. So, what was this stamp about? And if somebody can help me, I'm I'm genuinely asking myself. Here's the source for this Soviet stamp of 1961, uh, a 16th, 17th century um, manuscript that chronicles the decoration of the walls of the Uspensky Sobor in Vladimir. Uh, and sorry, I hope you see it. It's an, again, it's a mirror effect. It's the, the right part of the of the, um, uh, the co composition on, on your on your right becomes the left part of Rublev painting uh, on your left. Um, an ongoing uh, sort of uh, fight, but um, I mean, it's more like a quarrel because if it had been a fight, this would have ended in the gulag for this artist. This artist who uh, was claiming to freedom from, from the Soviet propaganda, Khrushchev told, told him the, the terms, the, the discussion went, went rather sour, but thankfully Nyevesny, the sculptor himself, was never again thrown uh, into um, prison or the Gulag, it's, it's extraordinary. That indicates what the, the level of the Thor was about. But Khrushchev tells him, you're an interesting man. I enjoy people like you, but inside you there are an angel and a devil. If the devil wins, we'll crush you. But if the angel wins, we'll do all we can to help you. And the two men shook hands on that, and you see them there. And, um, and 
Nevesny paid a price for his boldness because he was his work was completely systematically uh, forbidden for several years. Yet another weird contradiction. After the death of Khrushchev, whom did the family of Khrushchev turn to to do a memorial for, for Khrushchev himself? Nevesny. Now, I'm, I'm telling you this, I'm, I'm sharing this with you here, and I, it's very rare for me to, to, to do something like this. I, I'm kind of speechless. I, I barely can tell what is actually going on. So we're going to conclude with what I've been teaching now this semester with all these artists. Most of them have, like Nevesny, uh, never been to prison or never went to the Gulag. Some of them have exiled, uh, went into exile, like Komar and Melamid. Uh, doing a self-portrait of themselves as Lenin and Stalin. Here, it's ev all, everything is uh, slap on the face, uh, tongue in cheek, irony. The only one who went too far is the one to the left, Leonid Lam, who did go to prison through his uh, uh, puns, you know, Mach Machma, uh, Mother Darkness, and he did things even more provoking than this. But Slava, Slava KPSS, uh, Slava, glory to the communist, Slava Communistichiskaya Partia Sovietskova Sozusa. So this is again a sla major slap on the face using the religious terminology, Slava Bogu, to, uh, to glorify, but in fact to denigrate, we know that, the communist in. in uh, communist organizations and a group of very young at the time 70s 80s uh, uh, artists who utilize often uh, metaphors religious metaphors biblical metaphors in order to denigrate to to make fun of but in a sort of gentle way not in a very aggressive way the 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 uh, soviet ideology uh, you know artists parading like these two guys to the right the the sign in the middle is actually a detail from an abstract expressionist American artist, Franz Klein. So they're parading in the streets of Moscow, showing this, this little detail. Nobody, nobody, first of all, it was absolutely forbidden to see books on abstract American art at the time, but nobody could have read that. So what is this about? It's about the futility, the absurdity, the, the, the non-entity, the nihilism of the... Uh, uh, ideology of the, of the leftovers of this uh, almost uh, century-long um, experience with uh, communism. Nasha Tsiel communism, our, our goal is communism. Now, do, do we think so? Um, and this, this parade, this, this banner with the uh, letters being um, hidden. I love this one too, um, if you read it. Uh, and Michel, I'm going to give you this uh, material so that if you want to distribute it to some of the audience, because I know we haven't gone uh, through. Um, this is essentially a poem, so it looks like a, like a you know, communist banner um, proning for the, the proletariat's rights or, or whatever. Um, and in fact, it's a simple, absurd um, uh, statement, slogan-like statement about enjoying being in the middle of nowhere. It's in a field of snow, nobody can see it anyway. And here is what, uh, what uh, 75 years of Soviet ideology has led to. This is what, so this we're going to end with, a, they did a lot of uh, actions. Of course, these actions had to be sufficiently discreet, not to say um, invisible, not to raise attention to, from the authorities. And this is this one called Payavlenie, I love the term itself, um, appearance where the, the group of artists who knew each other would go from flat to flat and say, okay, let's meet on this Sunday, 50 miles north of Moscow. You will take a, a, a train, leave the train, leave the station, walk for seven miles, and you will see there a field of snow. This is where we shall meet, and that is it. That's the description of the action. Interestingly enough, these kind of situations, I'm going to close on this, um, the celebration of a field of empty snow, uh, probably resonant with what you see in Jordanville right now, uh, of course echoes uh, Kazimir Malevich, other important suprematist composition, white on white, there's the, the black square, there's also the white square, but also echoes this uh, icon, which you see in the Zimmerli Museum when you come in, and look at the documentation of these so-called collective actions in Moscow. All these artists are still alive today. 
Much of it was collected by an American person who was in Moscow during the 70s and 80s. And he looked at every form of transgression, of opposition, of dissent against the um, Soviet ideology. And first and foremost came a few absolutely glorious icons, which are the first things you see when you go into the Zimmerli Museum looking for traces of these evanescent collective actions having taken part in the Soviet Union over the last few years. Thank you. Uh, I'm delighted, uh, Misha, to take questions. If it's not too late, I'm looking at my clock, I see that it's already 2.15, so it's really your call. Thank you, Joachim. I think you have not spoken enough, judging by the wonderful comments we have seen uh, this far. I will read just one to as an example of just how well this presentation has been received by audience, how many thoughts and questions it has inspired. Uh, Maria Luisa writes, I simply love this expose by Professor Joachim Pissarro. Please bring him back for another lecture. Fascinating. I have learned to see better and understand Russian art. And when we were preparing for this presentation, we jokingly said that this would be a two uh, day uh, event uh, of 16 hours each. And I think that that was not <laughs> far from the truth in terms of what what could be still said. So <clears throat> the first question is uh, from Agnes. She says, how much sway did the Orthodox Church have in keeping art in line with the dictates of the church? And if it's changed, what, when and what inspired the change? Mm. Um, well, it's, okay, this is a, a huge question, but a very important one, actually, a central question to uh, kind of under, underpins most of what you've seen, uh, certainly up to the up to 1917. Uh, I, I would say that the perhaps an important moment is when uh, the, I, I forget the date because I'm, I'm not a church historian, but there's this, uh, the moment when the Patriarchate of Moscow is trans, the, the authority is transferred to a synod. And, and I believe this happens during Piotr, during uh, Peter the Great, doesn't it? I think, I think so. And that, that moment signifies uh, and really talks to the core of Agnes's question, it signifies that basically authority of the church is kind of taken away from the church and the church is brought in. There's no more, no more patriarch. You have instead a synod really led by a metropolitan, but the, the relationship of the church to the state is made much more evident, much stronger. So uh, what, in fact, in a way, your question could be a circle back because what, it, what happens is that it, by this particular move, the emperor, the tsar, the sovereign, takes away from the patriarch the, uh, a number of um, prerogatives and a number of uh, uh, privileges that the church had over its own practices and its own parishioners. Uh, it makes the church, and, and that, that lasted for a very, very long time. I think until when uh, uh, Patriarch Tiron was reinstated as the first patriarch, yeah. and that, that happened during, I think, Nik Nikolai, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so just, I'm mean, sorry, this is a complicated question, but a very an essential one, uh, Agnes, and I would say that during, I mean, for basically the last uh, uh, three centuries, the church in, in Moscow, was far less powerful than it had been before. And I think this coincides with the other forces, which are actually neither controllable by the church, nor as it was proven by the uh, sovereign, by the Tsar himself, which are the, the um, outside forces, the circulation of ideas, uh, penetration of uh, the Romantic Revolution I mentioned several times. I mean, that's, that's not something you can stop. I mean, you know, and the Soviets tried, tried, but fail to uh, stop the import of any ideas or uh, penetration of uh, cultural uh, phenomena. You know, it was in, it was forbidden to wear jeans. It was forbidden to buy a book on American abstract expressionism. Um, but it happened nonetheless. It happened under, you know, illegitimately, illegally. But you, it was uh, uh, it was impossible to stop that. So, answer to your question one. It, from the 17th century onwards, the church has less power than it used to, uh, cannot really control everything. And two, what is actually interesting is that the church re, uh, is, is given back its powers by the Tsar himself. 
uh, and it's even before that happens, during Alexander III, I think Alexander III has a colossal role to play in the late 19th century, when he personally and establishes a whole system around him to bring back the, the Byzantine and iconographic tradition to Russia, turning Russia as an absolute center of not only of, of a repository of uh, iconography, but of knowledge, scientific knowledge, archaeology, etc., uh, about a, a tradition that had been totally ignored for centuries. Thank you, Joachim. Uh, another comment uh, from Jack, which we received when when you were looking at the uh, Levitan um, <clears throat> and the Repin paintings. I wanted to read that and, and perhaps give you a chance to uh, maybe talk about the relationship to nature in the Soviet period. You spoke about that in, during the pre-revolutionary, um, but we had sort of had to to rush a little bit uh, during the Soviet period. So, in Repin's Easter procession in the Kursk province. Uh, Jack writes, one might point to the decimated forest on the background hillside, which echoes a contemporary scandal, the cutting down of wide swaths of the Russian European forest. This is one of the wrong elements, quote unquote, wrong elements of the scene. Edipin is not only calling attention to the contradictions within the practice of religion, but also the casual, even destructive tendencies of, quote unquote, modern civilization, the almost sacrilegious cutting down of the quote holy russian forest so mm -hmm. could you comment a little bit on that and perhaps this relationship and, and the presence of nature in the soviet period as well as the pre-revolutionary wow yes yes i i just want to want to know which which picture um uh the the procession the procession uh by Ilya repin ah the procession oh, okay yes okay. on the sort of on the in the background of that particular painting, there is uh, a yes, 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 yeah, uh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh -huh. Yeah, no, that's this is an extraordinary question. I, I would like to to meet the person who asked the, the question. Well, I, I mean, I didn't have time to to go into the Soviet um, era more. Uh, I, I just really, I mean, in fact, you saw I was running through the Stalin years, but the the answer to your question would take play would would really be consonant with a moment when you know Malievich is kind of pushed aside and they they try to ban they, they yes they, they ban any form of abstraction the the irony is that at the same time literally in 1932 uh, Alfred Barr founder of the Museum of Modern Art here in New York uh, goes to Russia discovers uh, a Russian abstraction and brings it back by the by the drove to New York, to the Museum of Modern Art. But that's not the explanation to your question. What happens as, as soon as Stalin uh, bans uh, abstraction as an art, as a petit bourgeois art for elite and for the nose, uh, the, 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 the bourgeois people who can afford to go to museums and, and galleries, he instead uh, propose, becomes the proponent of an art that answers directly to the question that is being asked, that will celebrate nature, that will celebrate not only nature, but na the natural human body, that will celebrate the, the great uh, uh, triumph of the pro proletariat. Uh, the, the, the irony, of course, is that during the years, the industrial years of uh, Stalin, nature was being decimated uh, to, to a very, very large extent, but nature became nonetheless, that's a very interesting point, a kind of symbol symbol of the victory of the proletariat and, and a celebration of the new natural forces uh, far away from the decrepit the decadence of bourgeois society. Thank you. I think we have time for only one more question. And Maria says, excellent, excellent presentation, a fabulous presentation by Professor Pissarro. And her question is, what happened to the Russian private collections in 1917, 1918? You showed some photographs of the, the collected works so with that uh, room that was just bursting at the seams with, uh, and uh, Maria is asking, what happened to the Morozov's collection? Was the Stalin period the worst for Russian art? Well, you know, I, I just uh, answered the previous question by saying it's it. it I, I definitely am not a fan of socialist uh, realism, but uh, it was, you know, it it became uh, the the source, and there are people who nowadays, especially sort of no, nostalgically, look back at it and th and think, oh well, what was going on in the 30s and 40s was not all that bad after all. 
that's this is not my voice, but that is something I've heard. So uh, was it the worst part of Russian uh, art? I would tend to think so, but it, it led to other forms of creation that are now being re-examined. Okay, that's the last part of your question. The first part has to do, is, is very interesting also, and um, so I should say that um, I've actually studied both the two major, major collections of Western art, but they also had icons and we don't talk about them, were Morozov, Shchukin and Morozov. Shchukin had actually opened, he, he owned a palace in the middle of Moscow, four or five major collector of, of Matisse, and Picasso and Gauguin, I and, mean, and, uh, absolutely uh, incredible. And you see the answer to your question, those works today are either at the Pushkin Museum or at the Hermitage in St. Petersburg. Uh, what is interesting is that neither, both Shchukin and Morozov, in, individually, they knew each other very well, but they had very clearly planned to give their collection to the nation. Otherwise, today you would have tons of restitution case. I mean, we hear a lot about uh, Jewish situations of restitution case against Nazi looting. Well, in, in the USSR, there was no such thing. In fact, the, the state, the proletarian state, the Soviet Union, or RSFSR, as it was known in the beginning, uh, basically enacted the instructions of each one of these collectors, except, and I'm not justifying Lenin or Stalin in this way, in the least, what Stalin was, uh, as far as I'm concerned, and here maybe I'm going to answer the, the second part of your question, uh, uh, illiterate visually and, and uh, had no in, uh, interest in uh, art whatsoever. So how did he uh, allocate the Morozov collection or the Strukin collection, like a deck of cards, he picked up the one here, one there, one there. So one is going to Leningrad, one is going to the Pushkin, one is going to etc. So when you look at it, when you look at both museums, these two collections make no sense whatsoever. Uh, they are made of incredible treasures, incredible, um, uh, you know, some of the greatest, greatest, greatest masterpieces by the, the artist I mentioned. But there was a, a, a raison d'etre, there was a, a vision behind each of these collections, which has been completely broken by Stalin himself. Thank you again for this bold approach to looking at an overarching theme in spanning the 19th and the 20th centuries. I really appreciate your time and your effort in, in putting this together and sharing it with us. Thank you to all of our attendees today, and I look forward to seeing you on April 1st for our next lecture on Sergei Rachmaninov. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Misha. I'm very happy to be there. Thank you.